Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for coming. Um, we would like, we are going to be in a couple minutes hearing from General, General Yashar Güler, the commander of the Gendarmerie Forces in Turkey. Uh, I just realized I failed to mention the Turkish ambassador uh, who is here also. Uh, I would like to recognize our, uh, our ambassador to the United States. Um, G General Yashar Güler has a long resume, of course, but uh, the one you have in the handouts is a little bit uh, outdated, so I want to read his full bio, uh, the most up-to-date one. Uh, General Yashar Güler was born in Ardahan in 1954. He graduated from the Army Academy with the rank of signaling second lieutenant. He served as the at as a signaling platoon and company commander at various units between the years 1975 and 1984. General Güler graduated from the Army War College in 1986 and from the Armed Forces College in 1988. As staff officer, he served as the chief of operations at the Internal Regional Command between 1986 and 1988 as the planning officer at the Evaluation and Inspection Division of the Army, as the chief of the operations and training branch at the 12th Infantry Division between 1991 and 1992, as the internal security battalion commander between 1992 and 1994 in Silopi, as the project officer at the Office of Military Senior Counselor of the Presidency between 1995 and 1997, and the dep as the Deputy Chief of Signals at the NATO Regional Command South, situated in Napoli, Italy, between 1997 and 1999. He also served in uh, various uh, European capitals. Uh, as Brigadier, Brigadier General, he served as the 10th Infantry Brigadier, Brigadier Commander between the years of 2001 and 2003, as the Chief of the Communications, Electronics and Information Systems Plan and Coordination Department of the Turkish General Staff between 2003 and 2005, and he was promoted to the rank of Major General in 2005. As Major General, he served as the Commander of the Communications, Electronics and Information Systems School and Training Center Command between 05 and 07, and as the head of training department of the Turkish general staff between 07 and 09, he was promoted to rank of lieutenant general in 2009. A in, that capac in that rank, he served as the commander of several command of general command of mapping between 09 and 2010, as the commander of the fourth corps between 2010 and 11, as the Chief of the Intelligence of the Turkish General Staff between 2011 and 2013, and he was promoted to the rank of General through the decisions of Supreme Military Council in 2013, and carried out his duty as Deputy Chief of the Turkish General Staff, and was appointed as the Gen Gendarmerie General Commander with the decision dated July 28, 2016. Um, General Yashar Güler, uh, obviously has a long distinguished military career in Turkey, but also uh, as part of his duties uh, as part of NATO. Uh, and the significance his of his presence for this conference, as you know, he was one of the uh, top uh, generals who, who were attacked at that night by the Putschists, and he was also kidnapped and taken to Akinci base. And we really look forward to hearing from him uh, personally. We appreciate his presence again. We want to thank him again. Thank you, General. Please. Çok kıymetli misafirler, değerli katılımcılar. Değerli milletvekilimiz Sayın Büyükelçim, kıymetli Silahlı Kuvvetler Ateşem, 
gerek Türkiye'den gerekse Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nden aramızda bulunan ve bilgilerini bizlerle paylaşan çok değerli akademisyen dostlarımız. Yine Amerika Birleşik Devletleri ordusundan bizlerle birlikte olan çok değerli meslektaşlarım. Ve bizleri bugün burada güzel bir ev sahipliğiyle ağırlayan, şahsıma sizlere hitap etme fırsatını sunan SETA Vakfı'nın çok kıymetli temsilcileri ve yöneticileri, değerli panelistler ve dinleyiciler. Teşrifleriniz için çok teşekkür ediyor. Öncelikle hepinizi sevgi ve saygılarımla selamlıyorum. Tabii biraz önce CV anlatırken aslında kısa olanı tercih ediyorum ama uzun CV anlatınca da aynı zamanda yaşımız da ortaya çıkıyor. Değerli dostlar, 15 Temmuz 2016 akşamı Türkiye'de meydana gelen darbe girişimiyle alakalı olarak yaşananları ve bu hadise bağlamında küresel bir tehdit haline gelen radikalizmde yeni bir yapılanma türü hakkında sizlerle deneyimlerimi paylaşmak üzere huzurlarınızda bulunuyorum. Öncelikle bizlere bu fırsatı verdiğiniz için hepinize ayrı ayrı teşekkür ederim. Değerli dostlar, Türkiye tarihinin her döneminde yaşadığı coğrafyanın bir getirisi olarak sosyal ve siyasal yükü ağır bir ülke olmuştur. Birçok ticaret yolunun kilidi durumundaki Anadolu toprakları üzerinde yaşadığımız için gerek Anadolu topraklarında gerekse Orta Doğu topraklarında mücadele olgusu hemen hemen hiç bitmemiş, deyim yerinde ise bir gün bile mola vermemiştir. 15 Temmuz öncesinde Türkiye yine ciddi bir mücadele ve arınma sürecinin içerisinde bulunuyordu. Bir yandan 7 Haziran seçimleri sonrasında daha önce görülmemiş şekilde tırmandırılan PKK ve DH kaynaklı terör hadiseleriyle mücadele ediyorduk. Öte yandan da öncesi olmakla beraber somut olarak 17-25 Aralık'ta başlattığımız devlet içinde yuvalanmış radikal bir örgüt olan FETÖ terör örgütünün illegal yapılanmasından arınma sürecini yürütüyorduk. Ekonomide herhangi bir kriz yok. 1 Kasım seçimleriyle yeniden istikrara kavuşan siyasal sistemde günlük rutin tartışmalar dışında herhangi bir kriz yok. Parlamento çalışıyor. Kamu düzeninde devlet bütünlüğünü tehlikeye atacak herhangi bir sorun yok. İşte böyle bir ortam içinde 15 Temmuz 2016 günü Türk Silahlı Kuvvetleri'nin Genelkurmay ikinci Başkanı olarak makam odamda çalışırken tahminen saat 21-25 civarında odamın kapısı çalındı. Ben de gel dedim. Ve o andan sonra yaşananların hiçbiri nefes alıp vermek dahil yaşanan hiçbir şey bu kadar normal olmadı. Birden bire içeriye büyük bir bağırış ve çağrışla yüzleri maskeli, asker kıyafetli on kadar darbeci girdi. Onların yat emrine uymayıp bir tanesini yere fırlatınca takdir edersiniz ki işin rengi biraz değişti. Bir karışıklık ve itiş kakış yaşadık. Ve bir Türk askerinin düşman askerine yapmayacağı bir muamele ile karşılaştık. Tabii etrafımı sardılar, beni tuttular ve bir şekilde ortamdaki hareketlilik duruldu. Bu insanlar özel kuvvetler personeli, eğitimli insanlardı. Sıradan düz asker değildi. Ve biraz sonra kapı açıldı, içeriye... Aslında o anda İstanbul'da kurslu olması gereken emir subayım sivil kıyafetle içeri girdi. Alaycı bir şekilde meraklanmayın komutanım bu bir tatbikat dedi. O andan itibaren olayın resmi zihnimde belirginleşmeye başladı. 
ve bir darbeyle karşı karşıyaydık. Ama bu eski zamanlarda yaşanan ve aslında hiç olmaması gereken darbe girişimlerinden çok farklıydı. 17-25 Aralık'tan beri resmi olarak devletimizin mücadele halinde olduğu radikal bir örgüt olan FETÖ iltisaklı subay ve subaylar tarafından gerçekleştiriliyordu. Müsaade ederseniz bu noktada size Türkiye'nin FETÖ tecrübesinden ve bu yapıdan biraz bahsetmek istiyorum. Bilindiği gibi aşırılık ve radikalizm veya küresel terör Suriye ve Irak'taki yoğun gündem nedeniyle DAEŞ üzerinden tartışılmakta ve takip edilmektedir. Oysa bu görüntü genel olarak kendini şiddetle tanımlamayan veya sınırlı şiddet eğitimi olan belki de bu eğilimini profesyonelce gizleyen örgütler ve oluşumlarla mücadele etmemize engel olmamalıdır. Şunu unutmamalıyız ki terör örgütleri de tıpkı modern yaşamın kural, kurumları gibidir. Eski tecrübelerden ders alır ve kendilerini yapısal olarak yenilerler. Yeni taktikler, yeni yaklaşımlar geliştirirler. DAEŞ, PKK, DAEŞ KPC, Hizbullah, El-Kaide, Avrupa'da ETA ve diğerleri. Klasik yapılanmaları ve kuralları olan, eylem biçimleri olan terör örgütleridirler. Ama Türkiye 1980'den itibaren belki de terör yapılanmalarının beta versiyonuna şahit olmuştur. Türkiye'de Diyanet İşleri Başkanlığı kadrosunda olan görünüşte basit bir cami imamı. Vaazlar veriyor, sohbetler düzenliyor, etrafında etkili olmaya başlıyor. Sonra etrafındaki kalabalık biraz daha organize olmaya, birbirleriyle iletişim haline girmeye başlıyorlar. Birbirlerini destekliyorlar. Kendi aralarında toplantılar, sohbetler düzenlemeye başlıyorlar ve ayırıcı davranış kalıplarına sahip olmaya başlıyorlar. Mesela bütün radikal yapılanmalarda olduğu gibi müthiş bir gizlilik hastalıkları var. Ve yine bütün radikal örgütlerde olduğu gibi üyelerini kendi ailelerinden, çevrelerinden soyutlamaya çalışıyorlar. Çocuk yaşta örgüte katılanlar için mahalle evleri, yurtlar, okullar ve dershaneler açıyorlar. Hemen hepsi yatılı. Bir kurum değil, bir fikir birliği. Kendilerine verdikleri adla bir hizmet hareketi. Örgüte katılanların dış dünya ile bağlarını koparmak için üniversite öğrencilerine yönelik evler oluşturuyorlar. Bu evlerde ağabeyler ve ablalar var. Her şeylerini kontrol ediyorlar. Örgüte kattıkları gençleri ve çocukları asla başıboş bırakmıyorlar. Ve yine aynı amaçla örgüte katılan kişilere kod ismi veriyorlar. Böylece tam aidiyet duygusunu sağlamaya çalışıyorlar. Radikalleşmiş kişilerin ortak özelliği bu kişilerin tercih yapma yetilerini kullanmak istememeleri veya buna ikna edilmiş olmalarıdır. Fetullah Gülen önderliğinde kurulan bu örgütte evlerde kalan, yurtlarda yetişen öğrenciler hiçbir tercih yapmıyorlar. Her şeyi talimatla yapıyorlar. Hangi mesleği seçecekleri? Hangi kurumda çalışacakları, hangi GSM hattını kullanacakları, hatta sıkı durun, kiminle evlenecekleri. Evet, bu örgütün veya onların deyimiyle bu yapının üyeleri kendi sevdikleri insanlarla evlenemiyorlar. Abiler veya ablalar hazırlanmış kataloğu şahsa sunuyor. Şahıs bu katalogdan birisiyle evlenebiliyor. Hatta... Eğer abiler ve ablalar uygun görmezlerse evlilik tarihini erteleyebiliyorlar. Çünkü örgütün onlara biçtiği bir rol var. 
Mesela şu anda örgütün uyuyan hücrelerinde evlenme oranı arttı. Yapının geri kalanını kurtarmak için onları normal, gündelik hayatla kamufle etmeye çalışıyorlar ve yoğun şekilde yine örgütten kişilerle evlilik talimatı veriyorlar. Talimata göre yaşama metaforunun boyutunu göstermek adına şöyle bir örnek vermek isterim. 15 Temmuz gecesi Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi'ni bombalayan pilotların savcılık ifadelerinde kendilerinin masum olduklarını ve sadece kendilerine verilen emirleri yerine getirdiklerini söylüyorlar. Düşünün, bir savaş uçağı pilotu, ordusunda görev yaptığı ülkenin şehrin göbeğindeki parlamento binasını bombalama talimatı alıyor ve bunu kendi zihninde sorgulamadığını bir masumiyet karinesi olarak aktarabiliyor. Eğitimsiz bir insandan bahsetmiyorum. Savaş uçağı pilotu gibi yüksek ve ciddi bir eğitim almış birinden bahsediyorum. FETÖ terör örgütü ile devletimizin mücadelesi buna ait farkındalığı özellikle sınırlarımızın dışındaki birçok ülkede algılandığı gibi sadece 15 Temmuz sonrasında başlamış değildir. Esasen bu süreci ve farkındalığı 17-25 Aralık hadisesinin de öncesinden başlatmak gerekir. Tıpkı insanlar gibi kurumlar da kendilerinden önceki deneyimleri kullanarak yeni adımlar, yeni yapılanmalar ortaya koyabilir. Bu açıdan bazı ülkelerin, bazı dostlarımızın FETÖ'yü bir terör örgütü yapılanması olarak tarif etmekte zorlanıyor olmasını biraz da bu yeni yapılanmanın yarattığı şaşkınlığa bağlıyorum. Çünkü daha önce görülmemiş bir örgüt davranışı ile karşı karşıyayız. Her şeyden önce çok geniş bir zamana yayılmış bir teşkilatlanma var. Ve bu süre boyunca istekleri güce ulaşana kadar radikal kimliklerini, yardım kuruluşu ve dini cemaat görüntüsüyle başarıyla gizliyorlar. Gücü adım adım elde etme stratejisi uyguluyorlar. Mesela bir kuruma önce bir temizlik işçisi sokuyorlar. Sonra bir güvenlik görevlisi. Sonra masa başında bir memur. Sonra daha üst düzeyde görevliler, uzmanlar vesaire. Her giden bir sonra gelecek olanlar için istihbarat, referans, rehber olma görevini yapıyor. Ve her kurumda örgüt adına sorumlu kişiler var. Dolayısıyla bütün bu süreci 30-40 yıllık bir perspektife yaydığınız zaman kurumların gücüne dayanarak gerek hukuki güce, gerekse silaha ve şiddete her an ulaşabilme imkanlarını elde ettiklerini görüyoruz. Ama bunu düğmeye basacakları ana kadar kontrol altında tutuyorlar. Yani silahları depolayıp, militanlar eğitip, hemen çatışma sahasına sürmeye gerek duymuyorlar. O silahlar zaten var. Devletin, uçaklar devletin, tanklar devletin, onu kullanacak askerler arasında kendi adamları olduğu müddetçe, ateş emri verecek komutanlar arasında kendi adamları olduğu müddetçe, o gücü istediği zaman, istediği gibi kullanma şansına sahip oluyorlar. FETÖ, Yaklaşık 40 yıldır sürdürdüğü bu yapılanma modeliyle Türkiye'nin bütün kurumlarına en alt kademeden en üst kademeye kadar eleman yerleştirmeyi başarabilmiştir. Fakat daha da önemlisi bu kişilerin geçirdiği onca yıla ve aldıkları eğitimlere rağmen örgüt bağlılıklarını canlı tutmayı başarabilmiştir. Bırakın yukarıda bahsettiğim savaş uçağı pilotlarını, 15 Temmuz darbesine karışan general rütbesinde insanlar vardır. Bu insanların birçoğu birlikte mesai yaptığımız, uzun yıllara dayanan tanışıklığımız olan insanlardır. Bir generalin mesleki kariyer sürecini düşünün. Ama bu insanlar 
bu kadar uzun sürecin sonunda bir gece ansızın gelen bir talimatla tamamen bir robota dönüşmüşlerdir. İşte o gece And that night and when I saw the treachery of my at the camp shows you the example from my perspective. This is the best example. If within the Turkish armed forces when we look at people who promote promoted in succession and they have these people who finish some of the best military schools in the world not only in Turkey yes when you enter this organization as a child at a young age and you get you are trained with certain techniques with the secrecy and following an order that we mentioned you can turn into a robot easily after what happened in my office they wanted to take me out of the building close my eyes they tied my hands and they put me in a vehicle while i got out of the building i recognized my aide de camp from his voice he opened opened the barriers and one day when i and they tried to take me away the security some someone has reached, reached the friends at the security so they didn't open the gates my at the camp got out of the car he said open the door or I'll shoot they didn't open the door and a conflict ensued shooting and the, tre the and my at the camp got killed in that fight the person next to me when i understood they opened the gates i sh put, put my shoulder to him and made him fall over after the push attempt next fall, next day uh, there was no spot on the car that wasn't hit by a bullet and i realized we survived by miracle the colleague who didn't open the gate and fired back had to be in a coma for, due to all the wounds he suffered and he opened his eyes recently and that gave you a clue about the structure of the coup attempt the july 15 coup attempt was organized by a group that infiltrated the military and made it look like a fait accompli this was an action of a group and an organization if you look at the number of people who joined this move, if we look at the ratio of these people to the general structure of the military, this is a very small group. The strategy that they adopted was having key traitors in critical spots, and they used guns, they were instructed to the cop coup, they followed the media communications, and they wanted to convince our population that this was a military coup. But at this point, if we look at our president and our government and our mighty nation, responded in a critical way and thwarted the scenario. The democratic reflexes of our mighty nation is indeed a reflex to ensure the continuity of the state. Our nation understood that this was a coup attempt by an organization and that it had to be put down and they understood this in a, f in a rapid manner and went to the streets. If we the coup attempt, if we look at the coup attempt, this was a small minority within the army. And they wanted to make this attempt look bigger and use a limited number of aircraft and tanks. This sh it should be noted, the Turkish military forces did not advance towards the nation. It was a group within the army and they wanted to activate the military forces and push through the coup. Perhaps this is the most critical point of July 15th analysis. If one fails to interpret this correctly, we cannot understand that FETO is a radical terrorist organization and we can't understand that July 15th was a terrorist act. If what, after what happened at the gate, they understood they couldn't take me out of the building by car. They dragged me into another car. 
and transferred me to another building. After we waited for a while, a helicopter arrived and the coup plotters headquarters, I was taken to the Akinji base, air base that was their headquarters. There I was locked up and afterwards I saw the F-16s take off from the ground. Later on, I was I was told that this was taking me to the air base was pre-planned. They started the armed phase of the coup. They wanted for me to be taken there to start it. Uh, I learned afterwards that our commander of the Turkish Armed Forces was also taken to Akinji Air Base to the next room. Uh, but eventually, being a man of honor in Turkish military so forces, he did not give any credit to the these pack of bandits and resisted. And there's, of course, a hierarchical order. We look at the coup attempt that was planned by this organization and its leader, Fethullah Gülen. There are these ranking colleagues outside that are, uh, for example, like the martyr Ömer Halis, their strength and courage is what hampered the bridge between the Turkish Armed Forces and this radical terrorist organization. From my point of view, if you look at the, one of the critical issues of the failed coup attempt, is that failed connection between the military forces and the terrorist organization. When we look at July 16, around noon, they opened the door of the room I was locked up in, and I heard a familiar voice. I said, hey, Yasha, what are you doing here? This was someone I worked with for a long time, for years. Our families had met, and it was Akın Öztürk, the air chief marshal. He was wandering freely where I, while I was in handcuffs. His aide de camp was accompanying him and giving orders. And he told me that he was surprised at my presence. I'm telling this for my American friends. We have an idiom in Turkish. It's about faking a friend. He was showing a fake friendship towards me. But at the same time, it was interesting that he was free in that situation. If he had been on our side, he should have been treated like I was. But that wasn't the case. They, I, they opened my handcuffs, they removed my eye patches, and they offered me that I could speak to my family. No doubt, being a soldier, we are always on full alert as members of military, and we should be always uh, careful about struggle, and this is our way of life. In a, within a few minutes, despite these changing circumstances, I was not relieved or relaxed. I tried to focus on figuring out what was going on and the network of the relations. For example, despite the offer that they provided for me to call my family, I didn't move. I understood that every action I took would be an excuse for their crimes and murders. They dialed my home with a fixed line and I shouted out from where I was and I said I was okay. I did not approach the phone. They probably didn't detect any change in my attitude, so they left me in the room. And Air Chief Marshal Lukan Oster reminded me as he was leaving that there were guards waiting in front of the door. At this point, you've, I felt bewildered and sad, and I realized that uh, the structure of the organization facing us was a lot different than what we knew so far. The man in front of me was a chief marshal of the Air Force. Uh, as I said, we had a personal relationship that went on for years. He was a colleague for a long time. And despite these high degrees and a long career, he was using this good cop, bad cop role as he approached me. If we consider these all together, we understand 
the all elements of this radical organization, and that's how they were within our daily lives. Radicalism isn't a brand new problem. It's everybody can see this, nobody can ignore it, and it is influencing all the 7.5 billion people that live on this earth. And worst of all, it is expanding using the power of communication and technology. If we look at this concept, this is just like combined vessels. This is distributed evenly throughout the globe. The bombs are in Baghdad, Shanlurfa, in Berlin, and in London. And more importantly, radicalism can distribute itself both to the results and the consequences. These actions can be carried out by single organization or different organization with different purposes. If we look at the motivating factor of radicalization, it might be different religions or different ethnic origins. People, these people with average, above average education or above average intelligence can carry out some of the most bloodiest terror actions in the world. People who spend a significant period of their lives and important duties in an army of a country may join radical organizations in retirement and turn all their experience into a problem. We today see, observe radicalism in Daesh or Boko Haram. However, if we look at Finland, Finland's with a per capita income of $42,000, their soldiers of Odin can come to the come come around and carry out anti-immigrant actions. What I'm trying to explain is this: our problem it doesn't have a Daesh problem, it doesn't have a Boko Haram problem. It doesn't have an ETA, neo-Nazi, or other organizations' problems that we haven't heard of. The world has a radicalism problem. The names that I mention are the consequence of that problem and actors within it. If we do not identify the problem correctly, we won't be able to identify the consequences accurately, and we cannot find correct solutions. First of all, we have to identify this. Radicalization is a process. It is a process where the idea turns into a violence. It is the name of this process. Radicalization, first of all, starts with an idea. It's followed by a religious or ideological indoctrination process. And this process ends up in radicalization. Uh, that is to say, the minds get radicalized first, then the hands and then the fingers that pull a trigger or a fuse. Of course, to prevent radicalization, you cannot prevent ideas. However, if you look at the track, the traces and the common features of process, then these structures and persons can be seen to have a hate and intolerance about, pe about people who do not share the same idea. They f accept their view as the only truth, and they ignore different opinions, and they identify everyone else as a single group or a single structure. Furthermore, contrary to popular belief, people do not adopt radicalization. They don't get radicalized depending on their previous beliefs and ideas. First of all, they adapt, they get radicalized mentally, they get isolated from society, then they find most organized radical structure they can reach and become part of it. Then the process that I mentioned, just mentioned, the idea from idea to violence takes place. Today, the Daesh terror organization, if we look at them finding militants in the center of Europe, it's the biggest, biggest example of this. As a result, what defines a radical action from a democratic action is the use of violence as a method. And this sort of violence is what defines 
terrorism around the world. This is the radicalization is the most definite characteristics of terrorism. If you look at this theoretical framework that I provided for you, you can see this in all articles and books and analyses written on terror around the world. However, as a citizen, this ethnical marginal radicalism and false messianic based radicalism as a, in a as a country that uh, as a someone who comes from this country and so on these terrorist representatives this is a country with that lives through all these and as a citizen who joined this fight against these sort of terrorists and as someone who experienced what he experienced on July 15, I wanted to present you the practical results of this theoretical framework that I provided you. In that room, I'm not sure how long I stayed there. In the morning, I started hearing the F-4 fighter planes, and then, then the F-4s bombed the Akinci compound. Then I understood that the Turkish armed forces intervened into the actions of this terrorist group and take care of them. And you might have followed it in the media. The coup attempt was actually done faster than at an earlier time than previously planned. I want to actually respectfully disagree. They say that if it had taken place at the correct hour, it could have succeeded. Then everybody would be sleeping and the coup plotters would take precautions, etc. I want to ask you this. Would this people, would this nation not wake up on July 16? Would people not give the same reaction they gave at night in the following morning? Were they, if they were scared of weapons, they would have been scared of it that night. Uh, I don't think the reaction would be different. I think it would be incorrect to say that. If we look at the character of the coup attempt, we can see this as a terrorist group, action of a terrorist group, and the people saw this clearly. And the events followed accordingly. Thus, I don't think there would be a change in the reaction. And uh, that if that, the fact that uh, the the action was realized earlier, it would change the course. I don't, I don't believe this. What we see, uh, they, they, they, when they took care of the official channel, TRT of the government, they thought that people would give up, just like the old coups that happened, and that people would not show a reaction, and the rest of the army would just agree to this de facto situation that was created. However, at the call of our esteemed president, they understood that they needed to take a more treacherous way of using the armed version of their plan. And there has was a lot of pain in the following hours, but at the same time, there were a lot of heroic situations. There were 249 people who were marched, martyred. They were all sons of our people, our sons, and our, pe our children. I cannot describe the agony in my heart. May Allah rest their soul. We have 2,193 veterans in this event. May, may Allah bless them all and help them all. And the the positions that were lost in the coup in the first few hours were taken back one by one. The TRT was taken back from the plotters, and that was a signal that the coup attempt had failed. The bombs kept falling, but the people did not take a step back. After that, our military army and our security units, the coup attempt, they, they suppressed the coup attempt before morning. Distinguished guests, what I want to draw your attention to here is this. We are talking about a 40-year-old organization. And in the last three, four years, they have been in a conflict with the political power. And thousands and tens of thousands who infiltrated in the state organization 
and different parts of the government and state try to attempt a coup and they get thwarted by civilians who went to the street with bare hands and the security forces who devoted themselves to the state and their attempt fails. The next morning at sunrise people kept on with their lives. There was no interruption, no disruption to daily life. And on Monday when the market reopened, there was no liquidity problems, there was no crisis in the stock market. People were going to the banks, but not to pull their money out. They just wanted to convert their savings into Turkish lira to just support their government in case of a crisis in the market. I want to say that this is real power. I didn't want to start my speech, uh, oh, this has happened to us. Rather, I want to say that Turkey witnessed an unprecedented act of radical terrorist organization, and Turkey came, overcame this with its own internal dynamics. But there's a dangerous organizational structure here, and the world should be on alert against this kind of organization and this sort of radicalization. And Turkey is not the richest country when it comes to oil reserves. In economic size, it's not the most powerful country in the world. But if we look at the comparative advantage that Ricardo talked about, Turkey's comparative advantage is, is a struggle against crisis, its struggle of counterterrorism and its stru struggle against migration. Turkey, for a long time, lived with 70% inflation for long years. Thus, our nation is very sensitive towards economic operations towards it. Our country from was not uh, was one of the countries that got the least influenced by the 2008-2009 economic crisis, and has been fighting PKK for 40 years. And when we look at uh, Daesh and K KCK, that's the extension of PKK, and YPG and PYD. It has also been fighting these. And about the migration that came in from Syria, it has a policy of open doors and has hosted more than 3 million Syrians and spent $25 billion on these people. On top of all this, we witnessed what, what I just described above on July 15, but in the morning, it, the country woke up whistling. This is real power. This is not just economic power, but this is a power that was given to it in thousands of years to Anatolian territories, to civilization that existed there, and the political wisdom that these lands developed. Therefore, if we look at counterterrorism as a problem on a global scale, the world could benefit from Turkey's experience and the power that it has, and it could pay attention to its warnings and follow its guidance. Turkey has warnings about PKK, PYD, YPG, as well as FETO and Daesh. It has warnings towards the global world. Certainly each country will consider all these within its own internal structures and make decisions. However, it should be pointed out that this is not just Turkey's matter. When we look at the fact that the leader of FETO speaks Turkish and that the city that got bombed on July 15 was in Turkey doesn't mean that this problem just belongs to Turkey. This is a problem of radicalization. Even if it doesn't have actions about other countries, this organization can be an example for other terror organizations. This is like a sector, and these organizations are related to each other. We should not forget this. We will look at the period before Ju July 15. The, the fact that PKK was instructed to pursue a state of inaction, and that just shortly before that FETA members were exchanging intelligence with PKK's action, 
actions was revealed in our investigations and recorded in the report. Therefore, the world public opinion should come up with policies to counter the terrorist organizations and radicalization over principles, not over persons and countries. In conclusion, terror organizations are becoming institutionalized and globalized, and try, they are trying new strategies and methods. FETO amongst these is the most intricate and most strategically organized structure, but it is, one of, it is the newest for the world. It would be a mistake to see this organization as a relief agency and to describe July 15 as a political action and not interpret it as a terror, or terror action and to interpret it as a, as a struggle for power within the country would be a mistake. It should be noted that this sort of mistake shall cost our next generations to the extent of living in the grip of radicalization and reading democracy only in history books. Let me greet you with these thoughts and remarks and thank you on behalf of my country and listen to me patiently and sincerely. Thank you. That was an extensive communication. Welcome to Washington. You have honored us, and I know you have a busy program in Turkey, and you joined this meeting. That, that, that This has honored us. I want to thank you again. Now, I know that we have little time, and, uh, and our uh, commander, uh, we don't want to tire him too much, but we want to have a couple of questions, if you would allow it. We want to, uh, the, most of the questions we prepared were of July 15, but you talked about the events of that night and you provide a detailed account of that evening and your witness of the events. If we look at the period following July 15, if we look at the evaluations uh, around the world after July 15, and always talk, if we talk about the gendarmerie, uh, we look and the investigations that took part within the gendarmerie and the purge, the cleansing that happened, uh, there were questions about how much that affected the efficacy of the gendarmerie forces. What would you like to say about that? I would like to thank you for providing me this with this inf opportunity, truly. And this is not just a problem for my own country, but it is actually the problem for the world. And I had the chance to say a few words about this. This is, uh, this is an opportunity for me. I want to thank you. If we look at uh, July 15, the evening, and after ex having experienced that, people thought there would be chaos in our country, and our allies and friends thought, thought such. And, but that didn't happen. The gendarmerie forces under my command uh, naturally up till today uh, there have been 4,000 people who have been thrown out. Uh, however, if we look at if we have, if, if you can follow it, if we look at our 40 year struggle with terrorism, the gendarmerie command or the police and the military forces, they have, they have, a, they have the, had the most successful year of this 40-year struggle. And naturally, our officers, we lost about 25% of them, and we need to replace them as fast as we can. However, our, the, the heroes of our country, the hero, heroic children, will, will work harder heroically, and they will do better than the people we have lost. And in our country where we're fighting terrorism, they are really taking, have writing very big successes. So can we say that the capacity has gotten better? There is no capacity loss? Absolutely. I want to say there is, yes, numerically we have lost capacity, but uh, people who are full of faith, uh, they are actually turning this loss into success. 
Our second question is about another terror organization, PKK. The gendarmerie at this point, with the struggle with PKK, what is its position in relation to this? Uh, and there have been big successes, as you have said, but uh, there are continuous operations. Uh, would you like to say something about this? Of course, our country has been fighting the PKK for 40 years. And no, the PKK is recognized as a terror organization at the UN, at the EU, and at, by our American friends. But over the last couple of years, this there has been talk of how can we take them out of the terrorism lists, and this saddens us. PKK terror organization, if we look at our struggle against it today, is part of our 40-year struggle, and this has been the most successful year of it for many, many years. As, as someone who is a member of the Turkish military who have been part of the struggle for years, this year in our military operations, we actually had big successes during the winter. Every year, PKK actually prepares for the next spring and the summer actions. They have a preparatory planning period, and this is what happened with them. But this year, for the first time, during the winter, we actually had a very successful action against the organization and put them in a very difficult situation. And for the, the, the 15 and 20 members that usually walk around together in this organization, in their current structure, they, there's only three or four members who can wander around. Uh, the, if we look at the organization right now, there's no violent action that they can take. Uh, they have some uh, IEDs or landmines they place in places, or they want to attack. Uh, different military vehicles and suicide bombs. But if we look at, apart from these, and we look at the spring to up till today, there are no big actions that they could take. Last question from me. This is the security and uh, the military is a big uh, topic after July 15. If we look at the gendarmerie, uh, actually got connected to the interior ministry. And uh, what is this, how is that going to affect the security sector in Turkey after that? I want to correct something. The Gendarmerie Command is, has always been part of the Interior Ministry, Ministry of Interior. But however, when we look at this uh, conflict with terrorism if over the years, uh, Gendarmerie started acting like a part of the military and uh, acting in parallel. But after July 15, the Gendarmerie got completely connected to the Ministry of Interior, and this has been, we, we see the positive effects of this. All of our people can see the positive effects of this. The, we closed the Gendarmerie School, and we started the Academy for Gendarmerie and uh, Coastal Security, and there our training has begun, and in a modern education that will be followed. I hope that in the next few years we'll see good people who will struggle in be on behalf of their country and they will be trained there. So it's 1 p.m. today. I think I will have to be the bad cop about timing today. But uh, I know there are questions here, but I want to thank you. Uh, I, wa I thank you. Thank you for visiting us. You have honored us.